Thank you, Vernon. I think uh, Bob would agree with me that when Vernon calls and asks a favor, it is impossible to say no. So I see, see him nodding his head. I am, I am fresh off the campaign trail, having been to Iowa and New Hampshire and leaving tomorrow morning for South Carolina. So I did say to Bob, how would you like to spend the next hour talking about politics? Uh, but we are not going to do that. There's plenty of time to do that uh, around the dinner table, although you're welcome to bring it up to the extent you would like to, Mr. President. <laughs> Uh, but I do want to start with uh, uh, a question uh, that I think is on everyone's mind and, and ask you how that relates to what you do at the World Bank, and that is today the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped over 300 points. Now, we've seen a lot of fluctuation in the markets, uh, but on a day like today, does that affect the work that you and your colleagues do at the World Bank? Judy, if I could just start for a moment. Um, like you, I got the call from Vernon Jordan, but I have a slightly different reaction when my assistant tells me that Mr. Jordan is calling because in my life, what that normally means is that I'm about ready to leave office. And there's a transition team coming in. <laughs> <laughs> There's this very nice man, and he's about ready to measure the rates for the office. <laughs> but as you said, and I'm sure everybody in this room had the same feeling, for some reason, gets on the phone, you just can't say no. I don't know how it works but anyway. Um, but I'm delighted. Um, as for the markets, um, interestingly enough, um, that doesn't have the same impact on the bank. And in fact, um, because the, the World Bank is, is seen as a very strong financial credit, we have some of the same benefits that the U.S. Treasury has. We're, we're a flight to quality. So what it probably means is that our paper uh, has just improved a little bit uh, in terms of the, the value of its assets. But the bigger issue there um, is also the question of what does it mean when there's a slowdown or a problem in the developed economy for our clients and partners uh, in the developing world? And of course, this is one of the big questions that a lot of people are discussing because, as you know, uh, you've got tremendous growth in China, good growth in India. And so the big issue these days, and I'm sure one of the topics in Davos will be, is there decoupling? Uh, from the developed in the developing world. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's interesting during all the financial uncertainty that you saw during the summer and autumn, one measure of this is the, uh, what's called the debt spreads for the developing countries. And normally uh, in the past, if you've had great uncertainty in, in developed country financial markets, you'd see those debt spreads widen a lot. And uh, they were very, very tight, like a lot of financial spreads were. Um, they widened a little bit, um, but they haven't gone up uh, too much. And so what that suggests is that for many of the major developing countries, there has been a lot of progress in the sense of their financial stability. For many of them, it's, it's linked to the growth of some of the Chinas and Indias because, say, in Latin America, they've been benefiting from a commodities boom. Um, some of our uh, partner countries, uh, China, uh, some in the Middle East, um, are ones that are now the big homes of the sovereign wealth funds. Mm -hmm. So the sovereign wealth funds, which were uh, the big fearful uh, force in the autumn, uh, may now be the supporters of financial markets um, and the ones that recapitalize financial institutions. So <clears throat> what it really paints a picture of is, is that uh, the world is globalized and integrated. So yes, you have to get a sense of interest rates, wealth funds, so on and so forth. And that's very much part of the World Bank of today as opposed to the one when it was created 60 years ago. But the nature of those interconnections are a little bit uh, less certain. So my own, just to conclude this, I do think that the world isn't decoupled, uh, but I do think that uh, you're likely to see continued growth in the developing world, even with some of the uncertainty in U.S. markets. So if the U.S. catches a cold or even gets the flu, you can't necessarily predict how that's going to affect. You certainly can't predict for sure. I do believe it will have an effect um, in that, you know, if you look at China, for example, exports are very important. But 
there are still other major sources of growth in the developing world. Now, the connectivity is, if China does slow down, well, then you'll see effects in terms of commodity prices, and that has effects in some of the Latin uh, and other countries. But my point is, uh, you know, one of the, the shifts that you're seeing is the nature of those connections is adjusting and changing, and it creates some opportunities, uh, but also a greater degree of uncertainty for the developing world. And I want to come back to that in a minute, but let's talk about your transition. You've now been at the World Bank six months. There was a fair amount of, shall we say, turbulence at the bank uh, before you got there. How has it you gone? You consider revolutionary <laughs> movements to be turbulent now. How has it gone? Uh, well, I'll let others be the judge of how it's gone. Uh, but I think from my perspective, there were a number of things it was important to do. Uh, first, um, they're really, uh, we've got a couple people here who introduced me, or introduced themselves from the bank and IFC, our private sector arm. Um, there, there was certainly a great deal of um, uh, anxiety, lack of trust, uh, some, some pretty big entities that had been built up. Uh, and so, frankly, the first challenge was to try to calm the waters a bit, uh, which required a lot of listening, talking to people about some of these issues. But it was my judgment that uh, the best way to get an institution um, back on a course or direction was to focus uh, on the mission. And it was my hope, and I think this has been borne out, that uh, the people who come to the World Bank Group, and that includes IFC, the private sector side, the IBRD, the traditional bank, and MEGA, the insurance side, um, come because they're very much committed to the mission of development. And the best way to get people uh, away from the water cooler, if it were, is to get them focused on the task ahead. So we worked with our board early on to try to uh, take some big steps. We put together a package uh, that drew from the net income of the institution to make a big contribution to something called IDA, which is the, the fund we have for the, the poorest, the 80 poorest countries. And this was part of our challenge because uh, every three years this fund has to be replenished. I came in in the last six months of that and the climate was not so good. And one of the things we could do to jumpstart it was to the, the, the commitment that we got from the World Bank's own income um, was over twice as large as in the last replenishment. So we followed the principle of many people who've been part of fundraising here, we put our money where our mouth was. We also uh, cut prices for the middle-income countries. And one of the unusual things to understand the World Bank is that while it's a very sophisticated financial institution, it's also a multilateral institution. I have a board that represents 24 different countries or constituencies, and just as an element of that, the prices had not been changed since 1997-98, um, which was a little different than it was in the world I just left at Goldman Sachs. And that's because this was a very complex negotiated arrangement. But this helped deal with some of the so-called middle-income countries because they felt that they were paying up too much and the developed countries were using that money to give to the poorer countries. So we took that step as well. We also tried to connect IFC, the private sector arm, which is a great innovative institution with some of the challenges of the, the poor countries. That ended up being very valuable, Judy, because it, it showed we could put together a rather advanced package, move it ahead, then that led to our effort. We had a very successful close to raise $41.6 billion for the poorest countries. That gave people a sense of success. And then on the challenging issue of the governance and anti-corruption, we had the good fortune that Paul Volcker was asked to do a commission. And he produced a report that I think gave us a, a, a good roadmap. So the pathway um, is there, but there's no doubt, and what I always tell the ministers that I deal with, People shouldn't underestimate the, the difficulty of that period in upheaval. And I'll close with this. There's one more point, however, and that is what the upheaval, in fact, uh, masqueraded a bit was even more fundamental challenges because I made a reference to you know, the World Bank being created as one of the Bretton Woods institutions in 1944. Just as the world has changed enormously, so these institutions have to change. And it won't be a surprise to anybody in this room, sometimes public institutions change more slowly than private ones. And so part of the challenge was to also get the, the institution refocused on some of the challenges that you started out talking about. So 
Another thing we did was to try to outline some strategic directions to do that. So the good news, I think, is that by and large, most people I, have responded positively to this. I think they feel a sense of mission. We've gotten great support from the countries that contributed to Ida. I think the developing countries, both poor and middle income, sort of see the possibility. But the reality is the challenge of adjusting the mission to a new era uh, is going to take a considerable period of time. You mentioned yourself, cor the corruption investigation, Paul Volcker. Uh, the World Bank is, is in the front pages just this past week with this investigation. You all have done turning up, what, half a billion dollar program in India where there has been corruption. Do you know the depth of that? Do you have a, you feel that at this point you have your arms around that piece of what has been essentially dug up by these investigations? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that Jim Wolfenson started and Paul Wolfowitz uh, pushed forward was a recognition of the criticality of dealing not only with corruption, but the broader issues of governance in countries. And obviously, if you're going to go out and try to get support from countries to raise money or even raise money in debt markets, you've got to make sure it's not stolen. And of course, the money that's stolen hurts the poor most of all, because they're the ones that don't get the benefit of this. So I think what started this uh, sort of most recent sort of period over the past couple of years was that the institution um, and further armed an internal investigatory unit. And for people in a Washington audience, I think this will be familiar. Whenever you create such a unit, I was in the US government when people started to create inspectors general. Uh, they're not exactly met with warm arms, right? It's kind of a, it's a, it's a question about you know, how it's going to change operations. And I think the part of the problem was that um, the institution naturally res resists this. And then the question is, is they then realize they can't escape it and they start to work with that uh, body, uh, how do you make it work together effectively? And I think part of the problems was there was a level of distrust and tension created that precluded that. And then because of some of the internal turmoil or for other reasons, nobody really could get on top of making that work. And what, where I think Volcker was very helpful is that some of this goes to things that may be a little boring in the sense of wiring diagrams, but they're really important, which is when somebody does a piece of work, how do you connect this to trying to make improvements in the country? So one of the things you were referring to today was, this, it was India. What this project, this report, was, a, was actually a diagnostic report. It wasn't an investigative report. It was a diagnostic report. And one of the questions are, so what do you do when you get this thing? So my first week there, I had these huge reports dumped on my desk that sort of basically said, only you can look at this. You know, and so what do I do with it? Who do I share it with? You know, how do I make action on it? Um, you mean and, literally your first week on the yeah, job? Yeah, oh, you have no idea. <laughs> and, and so uh, part of what Volcker did is start to say, okay, when you get these reports, when do you share them with the country? How do you, know, what, what, how do you uh, where do you redact information? How do you connect it with the ongoing work of the investigatory unit? How do you share with the board? And the India one was a good example because um, it's, it's, a, it's a very important piece of work. It points out not only problems, it, it's not $500 million worth of corruption, but there's $500 million of programs with corruption in it. And, and yet, uh, then the question is, uh, what do you do with it? And it gives you a little feel, and people used to Washington policymaking will have a sense of this. We, um, I knew that this was going to come out, but I didn't know what it was going to be. So as early as September, when I met the Indian finance minister, up in New York at the General Assembly, I sort of alerted him and I said, we want to work with you on this, but it's going to be very important you have a strong response as well. And fortunately, he's very experienced professionally, he knew that was in his interest. And then I saw him again in October, tried to explain again our timing that I saw. I got this two volume document over the holidays. Um, and fortunately, uh, with the help of some of my colleagues, for once we had some good document security, so it didn't immediately leak to you and your friends. Um, and, and, uh, and then I called the Egyptian minister and uh, said, I've got this. I'm going to give you the exact same document I've got. And this wasn't always the case. And I'm going to ask one of our managing directors, Ngozi Akanjo-Awela, who is a 
former Nigerian finance minister who made quite a reputation fighting corruption herself, to go out and together we try to develop a joint action plan, uh, which we did and we made a joint announcement. So the reason I've given this a little bit of more attention is it's, in, it's, it's like some of the foreign policy issues you do with. When you have these problems, you have to decide, do you want to try to work with the party to try to fix the problem? I can't go prosecute cases in India. Um, or do I, to what degree do you want to sort of uh, make it more of a stand on the podium and kind of wave the flag and say this is very bad? We said it's very bad. My own view is to really address this issue, we need to try to work with the Indians to do it. That doesn't mean you're unwilling to use leverage and you're not willing to be tough. Sometimes it's best not to embarrass people publicly uh, when you do this. But those are symptomatic of the type of issues. But they occur all the time, Judy. And, and part of this is a challenge of not just when you find it wrong. I'll give you an example of one of the things. I mean, corruption issues come up all yeah, the time. Yeah, but I'm going to connect it to governance issues. Is, is that um, one of the things that Paul Volcker's commission pointed out, very important, said, look, what you really want to do is have program integrity. You don't want to just catch people in advance. You want to try to prevent these things. And he suggested, this idea that I had as well, is that we needed to try to set up a unit that drew lessons from the internal investigations and to try to help the line offices build these into the programs. It's a very good idea. It doesn't assure everything, but again, what you got to do with, you know, take a country like India, it's, you know, a billion people, and there's a lot of poor lack of capacity. How do you work with them to improve their governance? And what lessons can we learn? And I'll give you an, an idea, sort of small and big. One of the lessons we've learned is that, um, for example, if you have a, you're given money to local schools, uh, if you simply can publish the information and print it on the schoolroom door so the parents in the community can say, well, they said they were given X for books and I never saw the books. You create an internal uh, sort of check-in device, sort of like a free press. <laughs> but another way is to try to work at a higher level, um, and we've done some things with this, to try to have um, budget programs developed so that they're put on the web uh, in, in African countries. So the point of this is that it's not just going hunting after uh, people that are stealing. It's how do you build this into everything you do? And part of the lesson, I think, of development is that you can have great ideas, you have great projects, but you got to have country ownership and you got to build the institutions to make this work. And, and just quickly, how much of your time, I mean, I, you've given us this you know, explanation of what you've been dealing with, how much of your time is dealing with some of these? corruption questions. Is this a small percentage of what you have to worry about at the bank? Is it much bigger than that because it clouds, it has a potential to cloud everybody's uh, impression of what the bank is doing? Well, in a sense, it, it to a degree it runs through not everything, but most everything that you do. So just to give you another example, shortly after I was there, I launched an initiative, something that uh, I inherited, but I was able to give some more attention called the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative. And this was to work with developing countries to use some UN conventions to help them have the capacity to use international legal arrangements to get some of the stolen money back. This is important for developing countries in part because, frankly, they feel a lot of developed countries are on their case all the time and they say, where does the money end up? Switzerland, you know, US, some other places. And this is trying to take advantage of some new UN treaties to be able to get developed countries to sign up and get the money back. So if you believe that part of a core part of development is getting the institutions to work, getting the property rights, getting transparency, it's a lot of what you do. Let me give you a small example. One of the things we did with this India uh, report was, you know, we promptly put it on the web. So Transparency International is very positive about this. So, you know, for people, again, who've been in the Washington environment, some of this is not shocking stuff about how you have to try to um, sort of, even when you got bad news, you get it out Whatever. there, and, 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 but you got to have some sense of how you're responding. Now, having said that, the, there's an awful lot that the bank does that is very positive for countries. And so, obviously, while we have to focus on anti-corruption and governance, it's obviously a little frustrating to me when that's the sole story because there's a lot of other things going on out there and a lot of interesting initiatives and a lot of people working on things and it, it also affects morale i mean because you know the bank 
in an odd way, it's a little bit like the United States. You're everywhere, and you're you know you're part of things. And when people want somebody to blame, you're there to blame. You know, so uh, part of my challenge as an institution coming out of this period was how do you motivate people when there's shell fire coming in all the place, and you know you got you got conflicts among the staff to try to focus on the agenda ahead. So you know some of the other things that that uh, I set out in a speech early in my tenure after 100 days, we're trying to set an offensive agenda. I prefer to be on offense than defense, if I could. Well, speaking of offense, uh, uh, the, uh, the, a lot of talk about the bank, you, you mentioned the so-called middle income countries like China, and increasingly people say, well, wait a minute, we thought the World Bank was there to help the poor countries, but China, you know, this is a country that is what, it, what putting $3 billion into uh, Blackstone. Uh, this is a country that is, uh, you know, spending millions and billions on all sorts of projects. Explain to us how, you know, what the mission of the World Bank is in these countries that are doing better and yeah. better and have their own economic engine, yeah. but they still need help from an institution well, like that. It's a very right? important question. I appreciate you giving me a chance to address it. Um, <clears throat> first off, if you look at the people living under $2 a day in the world, over 70% of them are in China, India, and the so-called middle-income countries. So the first point is, this is not what you see when people are anxious about competition from China and India, but there's a lot of poor people in those countries. But second point, and I think this is the one that, uh, given my background in foreign and economic policy, might be most important. When I look at the world today, and I say the degree of globalization and integration, and the role of multilateral institutions to deal with some of these problems, the last thing you want to do is to take an institution like the World Bank and just have it for the developed countries and the poorest countries. One of our biggest challenges in the world, whether it be economic, security, climate change, is how do you integrate the Chinas and the Indias, when I was in the State Department, I talked about it as responsible stakeholders into the system. So to relate that more specifically, I was just in China in December. About 75% of our projects now deal with environment. And so I was talking with Roger Sant about climate change. If you want to deal with climate change in this world, good luck doing it if you don't have the Chinese part of it, because in 2005, they were building, on average, a new coal-fired electricity generating plant of 100 megawatts or more every other day. Okay? So how do we get them to share some of the responsibilities in that? And how do our projects help that? But then there's, there's two other dimensions that are really important. One is that one of the reasons that I went to China and it's one of the things I try to do in China with the U.S. and the World Bank, is to recognize that our relationship with China is not only about what's going on in China, but what's China doing on the outside. So the best way to build China as a partner is to show some sensitivity to China's issues. But I spend a lot of my time talking with the Chinese Exim Bank, the Development Bank, the Foreign Ministry, the Minister of Commerce, about China's work in Africa, how we can work with them on these issues, uh, in the Pacific Islands, in Central Asia. So if over the long term, I believe the bank can help China be a more constructive partner in these issues. Now, there's one last issue uh, put by some and say, well, okay, but they, as you said, they got $1.5 trillion in reserve. Why do they need your money? They don't need our money. What increasingly we're doing is providing a range of, of services to them. And in fact, China is one of the few countries that can probably borrow a little bit more cheaply than us. So why do we do loans to them? Well, in effect, the loans in China are part of pilot projects that they design to deal with cutting edge issues, maybe healthcare, maybe urban rural, maybe environmental. And they are as rigorous as anybody in, in measuring them, testing the results. And then they take them and expand them to other parts of China. And maybe we can learn some lessons we can apply globally. And frankly, the modest return we get on those loans are compensating us for that service. And we, one of the things we need to do with middle income countries more generally is offer different ways of compensation. Some of it may be fee based, some of it may be working asset management services. In the case of China, they like loans because they feel if we got money in the game, we'll be more attentive than if we're just a think tank sort of offering ideas. So they think that it develops the projects uh, more effectively. But part of the business plan is to try to offer a greater variety of services. But let me expand this sort of beyond the China case. 
we developed some uh, hurt. But just explain the return again on, on China. Well, well, the point is, is that we 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 have expenses for these projects. And to go to this is that when many one of our problems is we're called the bank, <laughs> so everybody thinks what we primarily do is put money for it. That's not really our primary focus. When, when the World Bank works best, it's really bringing three things together. It's bringing knowledge and experience and expertise, maybe on healthcare, maybe on education, maybe on building domestic bond markets, maybe microfinance. It's taking and constantly upgrading that, making it better, maybe carbon markets. And then it is trying, because we're, you know, we did $34 billion of business last year. That's a drop in the bucket internationally. So what we do is we do those projects to help develop markets and institutions so they go much further than we do. So they may be microfinance markets, carbon markets. In, in Africa these days, I want to work closely with some of the natural resource countries. may not involve any money at all, but to help them with standards of natural resource development. And then the last piece is money. What does distinguish us from the OECD or university is we do have money to help make these go forward. And some of it through IFC is not government guaranteed money. It works through the private sector. IBRD has other funds. IDA has subsidized funds. We have different tools. So it's the knowledge and learning, it's markets and institutions, and it's finance to make things work. And what I was going to mention is we've got some very sophisticated financially some financial people there and what we're helping some of the middle income doing countries do is manage risk better so one example we we came up with an innovative program in the caribbean to help them with insurance for hurricanes um, that was a uh, so well received that the mexicans approached us and said maybe can we do something for earthquakes you don't have to do with insurance as people here know you can use various capital markets methods um, one of the things that we're doing, and this gives you a good idea in a way of uh, that it's not your grandfather's World Bank anymore, is, is the notion that we came up with um, the idea of developing domestic bond markets in domestic currencies. And so um, we're putting together a $500 billion fund to invest in many countries' domestic currency markets for bonds because you know, one of the problems that you would, if you think about past financial crises from Mexico or Brazil, was they issued bonds in dollars, and so they might get caught in a, in a foreign exchange risk. Well, this will develop their markets in their own currency. But, and this is a little lesson I also got from Goldman, to make this a potential asset class, we also developed an index so that people can uh, look at the performance just as you would in other asset classes. And the neat thing about it was this index starts out being weighted by the size of the bond market, but we also put in investability criteria, which means reforms. So the more they make various reforms of these domestic bond markets, the better they're weighting. And the last and neatest piece of this is we plan to exit the market in 10 years. Okay? So if you, going back to some of the experience I had at the Treasury Department, I've reflected on this. I was in the Treasury in the mid-80s, and some people here may remember, you know, you had the great change of the dollar values. And uh, during that period, the dollar really was the reserve currency. There was some, a little bit with the Deutschmark. One of the effects of that 80s period was it made the Deutschmark and then later the Euro into a reserve currency, which you now see it today, to a lesser degree the yen because of problems in the Japanese financial markets. Part of what we may be doing at the bank is not only developing domestic currency bond markets, but 10 to 15 or 20 years from now for investors in the audience, this will be an alternative asset class. And some of these may be, in a sense, uh, depending on if China opens its capital market and others, sort of additional reserve currencies. And the reason I, I talk about this is that it gives a sense that the bank's work ranges, we haven't talked about the things with the poorest countries or post-conflict countries, but the, the role that we can potentially have in the international economy is one of taking these vast changes in markets and trying to help countries across the range of development. So to close on where you started, our role is frankly to try to help make sure that the multilateral economic and development system includes the poorest, the developed, but those in between. And goodness knows, you know, it would be a terrible mistake to leave out those in between. The question is, how do we serve them? How do we get compensated? And the last point on China, the Chinese for the first time contributed to IDA for the poorest countries. It wasn't big, but in the world that I've lived in over the past 20 years or so of policy, you often plant seeds. 
And so now China sees itself, even though it's still a relatively poor country, as contributing to other poor countries. So at the same time China, the World Bank is giving to China, China is giving to the... Uh, well, we to lend the, to China. I, we, don't, we don't, I mean, we don't give, we lend. I mean, lending, lending. And we get paid back. Yeah. We're going to take questions from all of you. And uh, if you have a question right now, I thought while, while we're waiting to let you think of what your question is, I wanted to hear uh, uh, President Zelik <laughs> talk about the role of the World Bank in climate change. You mentioned you were talking about it at dinner tonight. I think people would be interested to know what percentage of the work you do is now connected around, you threw out a percentage a minute ago. Yeah, well, I, I guess maybe the way I would address this, because it goes to the point about not the percentage of sort of loan book, because part of what I, I think is where we can really help develop these markets. And let me just try to respond to it that way. Um, I was talking about this with Roger. When, uh, when we were in Bali, I put forward a number of points where I thought the bank could play a key role. The first is um, helping developing countries integrate adaptation and mitigation strategies into their development plans. Now that seems like mom and apple pie seems logical, but what it means is their energy plans, their land use plans, their transportation plans, it's not so easy to do that, but how to help them start to incorporate that. And for developing countries, you'll find there's a lot more attention to adaptation than mitigation. For a lot of these countries, this is a here and now problem. If you're in Bangladesh, where I was not long ago, you've got melting Himalayas, you've got the coast coming up. It's not, you know, how do we mitigate 20 years from now? It's how we deal with it today. That's one issue. Second, um, how can we provide concessionary and innovative financing mechanisms? So when I was in Bali, we put together a new uh, forced carbon partnership fund to help try to support these countries avoid deforestation. And we are working with the US and UK and Japan on some things in the technology and other funding areas. Third is carbon markets. And this to me is particularly fascinating because you're not gonna get at this problem unless you have effective carbon markets. And it's quite rudimentary in the state of development. So I won't go into all the details, but if you imagine how a commodities market works for oil or, or agriculture, I think we can play a key role in helping that market work. That isn't necessarily putting money on the table, it's helping uh, as a market intermediary. Fourth, technology. Uh, if you talk about um, you know, not only alternative technologies, but if you use my example of China and coal, you know, if, if you have clean coal technologies, if someday we have effective carbon sequestration technologies, you gotta have to get these to the developing countries much faster than people have gotten them in the past. Um, then another area is private capital. And just again, to give people a sense of the scale of this, the International Energy Administration estimates that developing countries are gonna need $170 billion a year for power plants just to stay up with their normal growth and development level. And if you want to use low carbon technologies, you probably add another $30 billion to that. So that's $200 billion a year. You're not going to get that from the public sector. You're going to have to create private sector incentives. So as a matter of policy and some of the things we can do with IFC on our private sector side, that's another thing. Another point is, for those of you that have been in the field of development, you'll know that 30 years ago, in many developing countries, if you're trying to work with people to develop a, a, a developing economy, you didn't necessarily find the people that you'll find today able to do that. In a sense, we need to develop a similar approach for low carbon growth strategies. In other words, if you go to China or most countries today, they know how to do the development thing, but the question is how to, how to build in low carbon growth strategies. So we have a capacity building effort. And the last thing is, if we do these other things right, we can help the UN and countries when it comes time to developing what follows Kyoto. And just to give you one example from Bali, other than a generalized commitment to probably the one other policy step was to say in Kyoto, countries could get credits, developed countries could get credits for forestation, but you couldn't get credit for avoiding deforestation. The very fact that, frankly, the biggest instrument talked about in Bali was our funding of deforestation efforts helped drive the policy discussion to say, okay, you can get credit for de avoiding deforestation. Now, why is this important? Well, 20% of the global greenhouse emissions are from deforestation. For some developing countries, it's over 50% of their amount. So it's a good example of how you know, we just took one area, we can do this in vaccines or HIV AIDS or others, how the bank can play a role with what's called public goods. 
and how we can be a catalyst, partly money, partly ideas, partly drawing people together. Uh, and so to come back to your point about governance and anti-corruption, it's got to be an important part of what we do, but it would be certainly a shame if it dwarfs all these things where we can make a big difference. Well, I venture to say most people didn't don't have any idea how much the work you do is is connected to. Well, that's because the something like the McNeil Laird right. News Hour, which should do policy stuff, which ought to be covering this. <laughs> All right, now it's your chance. Uh, raise your hand, and I'm going to call on you. And let's see, right there. Yeah, sir. We're going to bring a microphone to you. May we talk about women? Uh, three background data points. Uh, the World Food Program policy is informed by the fact that when men get food, they either eat it or they sell it. When women get food, children get food. Second point, on AIDS, uh, the UN estimates that 8 million farmers have died of AIDS in the last 18 years the majority of whom are women. That's four times as many farmers as we have in this continent. The third point is technical assistance. The UN estimates that of all the farmers in the world, particularly in the developing world, 85 to 90 percent are women. Do they get 85 percent of the technical assistance? No, they get less than 5 percent. I guess my question is, what are you doing about women? Um, this is a slightly formalistic response, but let me start with this. We actually, we have, we have a gender action plan that tries to reflect across our work. So let me mention, give you some examples. Um, the UN set up in 2000 something called the Millennium Development Goals. Some of you may know about them, which is to try to achieve various goals by 2015 sort of cutting poverty in half, uh, some issues with education and others. But a number of these are critical in terms of the gender issue because there's some about infant mortality um, and or it starts out child mortality, but uh, also maternal health. And in fact, this very week, uh, I was talking with my colleagues about the nutrition issue because it's one that in some ways has gotten less attention recently. Um, and yet it, it has multiplier effects throughout that. So the world has actually done better in terms of child mortality, but as one of my colleagues said, from negative nine months to two years, the numbers are still weak. So in other words, if you can improve nutrition of mothers, you not only help the maternal health, but you also help reduce the infant uh, mortality aspects. Um, the education, um, one of the Millennium Development Goals is to try to achieve universal primary education. And this is not only an issue for um, uh, boys, but also girls. And as you start to set this as a goal, you start to learn some interesting things. Uh, when I was nominated, I took a trip to many places, including Ghana, and I met some NGOs. And they told me that one of the issues that they learned in northern Ghana, where you have some Islamic populations, was it wasn't just a question of money, it was having separate latrines so that girls could go to separate latrines to get them to go to school. Um, in terms of the population issue, as probably most people know, education of women is very important in terms of dealing with that issue. So in a way, it, it's, it's like governance and anti-corruption. It's something that has to run through this set of projects. Um, microfinance uh, is another area where it's made a huge difference in some societies to be able to create some early entrepreneurial opportunities uh, for women. And I could keep going, but just to give you one core one is one of the six strategic directions I put out was to try to foster development and hope in the Arab world. Um, and this was uh, sort of interesting. We have the ambassador for Egypt here. Some of the staff and even some of the board members were saying, oh, well, be careful about this one. It's okay for poor countries, middle income countries, global public goods, but you really want to draw this out. And I've been extremely delighted that the response that I've gotten from the Arab world was, it's about time that somebody pays more attention to us in the bank. Uh, and there's some, some interesting innovation going on there. Egypt's a very good country where it's got a very good economic team. They've done well on the macroeconomic side, but now actually they're trying to do some things for people at the bottom. But one of the issues is going to be the role of women in these societies and how do they start to play a more active sort of economic role. And part of that's linked to the education system. So it really runs through the, the, the heart of what we're doing. 
But I'll share one other point with you you might find interesting. Um, I thought that the World Bank, which uh, for lack of trying to use two loaded terms, would be seen as a more progressive institution, would do better in terms of uh, female diversity at higher levels. I was actually surprised um, because the, the women at senior levels uh, were much lower than Harry Clark and I had at USTR, where I had about 60 or 70 percent of my senior people being uh, women. Um, and, uh, and so part of it is we also have some work to do in terms of building our staff. Uh, the, the two people that I've hired so far uh, have all both been women, uh, and one from the developing world, one from the developed world. But so that's another part of what we have to try to do. Who's next? Right there. Yes, sir. Please stand up. Uh, the World Bank is obviously a major force in the world. It's also a major force in this town. It is. Uh, it has got its headquarters here. It's a major presence here. I'm interested uh, to hear your views as to whether you think you have a responsibility as sort of a corporate citizen in this town to the to, to the city's development and specifically to the thing that the mayor has pointed out as the most important thing in town, and that's education. To what extent is the World Bank involved in education in the city? Um, I do think we have a responsibility. Um, I think it's to a broader community um, in in uh, in Washington. Uh, I was telling. Verdon Jordan, we had a program on Martin Luther King Day where we brought in some people from the community and it gave me an opportunity to review some of the community projects uh, that we have. And uh, I actually talked to some of the people there about, I'd like to try to see if we could do some more. We've had some special projects in Anacostia and, and some of the wards that uh, have been less uh, economically strong uh, in the District of Columbia. I'd like, we, we have some volunteer programs, but I would like to see if we might be able to target some things more specifically, um, whether it's in the education area. I actually raised the question about adopting schools and some things that I've seen done elsewhere. Um, it's, I have to approach this with a little bit of sensitivity in that, you know, I have a multi-national uh, 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 force uh, of people, and a number of them are from countries much poorer. And, I have to be a little careful in terms of not looking like the bank's job is to fix America when there's a lot of poor countries around. But I do believe we can make a good case for being good community members and do more things specifically uh, with the community and try to encourage uh, contributions from the, from the staff, uh, both in terms of time and also financial resources. Right there. Mm -hmm. Just so we get that no one calls me Mr. President, really. So. Fuck! Yeah. Well, I definitely think there's multiple roles, and sometimes they can expand. I, I went to Cambodia in August, and the bank supported a microfinance program with a Cambodian NGO that is now the second largest bank uh, in Cambodia. And it's focused a lot on uh, rural and, and retail programs that otherwise uh, wouldn't exist. So it's natural that many of these programs, just as if you think about the history of the United States with mutual associations as sort of initial cohesion, it's a natural way when you have small loans and you're trying to build cohesion and a sense of responsibility, it's natural to rely on uh, NGOs in that process. The debate, and, and by the way, I looked at a note over the weekend about microinsurance. There's a whole bunch of things that one can do <clears throat> to expand financial access to people that haven't had it as part of building opportunity and entrepreneurship. The issue that actually I'm encountering a little bit more is that uh, Muhammad has been, Yunus has been very effective. I saw him in Bangladesh. He's a great marketer too. Um, frankly, sometimes some people try to open the books and find out a little bit about some of the things that's going on. It's not totally clear, but nevertheless, uh, the, the, he's driven a very strong issue, including with the U.S. Congress, about uh, microfinance. And so I get a lot of letters 
saying about increasing our investments in microfinance. And it's a, it's a bit of a tricky issue, and it comes back to one of the points I said. We've actually been pretty good on the policy side in creating the right regulatory climate, coming up with technological innovation. I met with the Gates Foundation this week, and you know, we've been involved with this project to use mobile phones in Kenya and other locations, so you can sort of leapfrog various technologies to expand financial access. Um, we've had this very successful doing business report that's helped, and we're now going to try to do one dealing with sort of financial access. So it's not simply, if you think about building markets and institutions, it's not simply how much money you put into it. Our IFC side is actually putting in a lot more money into this, and that's the private sector, and, and it's growing, and of course it gets leveraged you know, 10, 15, 20 times if we invest in small NGOs or other projects or small private enterprises. The problem we found a little bit, and this goes to the different nature of the bank, the, the IBRD side lends to governments. And so we have to have a government that wants to do it and do it in a way that will be successful. And we've had some very successful government projects. We've had some in Afghanistan. Uh, one in Pakistan didn't work. The Bangladesh one worked. I think what Eunice would often stress is that you actually need to keep the government out of it because there's always the danger of how it gets manipulated. So you need to have a, a sort of a non uh, a board, even if it's government money, that is separated from it. That's not always so easy to do in some of these countries. So um, I, I personally think that this is a very rich area in, in lots of dimensions, including, uh, for example, rural agricultural credit. The bank did, as part of our World Development Report, kind of revive the attention to agriculture and its re uh, poverty reduction effects. And it's kind of interesting. It's a sector that people haven't paid as much attention to in the developing world. And what you can see is that the benefit of a dollar's growth in agriculture GDP has three times the effect of poverty reduction than other sectors. It makes sense. It's in a rural area. And, and yet when you look to see what you need, say, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's not so much the Indian green revolution, where it's sort of the, the, the technology of the seeds, it's you need everything along the value chain for productivity. You need irrigation, you need uh, uh, financial support, you need marketing systems. And intriguingly, something that I've observed in India is when you read about the suicides of farmers in India, these are not subsistence farmers. These are people that have started to move to the market and they've got no margin for air. So for example, they get somebody to drill a hole for them and there's no water and they're in debt and they've got no future. So one of the other things we're trying to build in is, in a sense, some, uh, some ways to try to support people uh, that are making that move. So it's a good example that the bank, as a financial institution, can help develop financial markets from the very poorest to domestic sort of bond market development, and I was talking about big potential. A reminder, you're dealing with human beings and not just with institutions. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Who's had his or her hand up a long time? Let's see. Over here? Wait a minute. No, you. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you. Bob, appreciated your thoughts this evening. I wonder if you might close with some remarks on a day that the domestic stock markets were down so sharply. Um, with your thoughts on some of the areas in the world where you really are very positive on growth and development. Uh, maybe areas in emerging Africa, areas in emerging Central Europe, those types of things. Where do you see real dynamism going on in the public-private sector cooperation? And uh, where does the bank see sort of tremendous development? Some of the stories that we ne don't necessarily see in the newspaper, uh, but that you'd like to leave with us. And can I just throw in a postscript to that question? And as the president comes back from this trip to the Middle East and the Persian Gulf, can you just in a nutshell tell us what is the bank doing? What are in, in international institutions doing that, that in a way do play, don't play, don't have a, have a role as, as, as the United States pushes them to, to, uh, to make peace with okay. one another? Um. And I, I want to add one third one in there, which is post-conflict countries, because I think this is going to be a very important challenge for development in the bank and others. But um, in terms of opportunities, I don't have any particular uh, exciting insights. Uh, 
same ones that I would have shared with you at Goldman and where I was making a better living, was that, is that you, know, you better pay attention to what's going on in China, in India, in the Middle East, in different areas, Russia in, in some aspects. Um, but each of these markets, as you know, require sort of disaggregation and sophistication. But if you look at many investment banking firms now, they expect their revenue growth in these areas uh, to be you know, as important as in the, the core markets. So I think that's going to be very significant. Um, in terms of the, the Middle East in particular, um, one of the reasons that I focused on Arab development uh, and hope was, I think, the larger issue in terms of challenges in the Middle East is that you have to give people some sense of, of uh, a future. Um, and so you know, my career has been a little bit of an unusual mixture because I've done a lot in the economic and security as well as political areas. So I'm not a person who believes that um, poverty causes terrorism. Uh, it's an insult to a lot of poor people. And if you look at the demographics of terrorists, they tend to actually come from upper or middle income. But it, I do think it's the case that when societies lose any sort of hope uh, and they fragment, those become the breeding grounds for trouble. So part of the answer to your question, Judy, is I think we, we have a very strong interest in trying to help create a sense of future and opportunity in, uh, in these countries and work with governments that want to make things work. Another step is it's not just economic growth, it's also the social development agenda. So I know this is a point people are sensitive to in Egypt. If the government is unable to provide the social development that they want, well, everyone knows, others will. And some of those groups are ones that might cause some concern uh, for the established authority. So the government has an interest in that. But let's take a more particular example related to the president's trip. Um, I just, I met this week um, with Rob Mosbacher, who's the head of OPIC. Uh, the bank has been really the key player in providing the people on the ground and the basic services in the Palestinian territories. Um, when you read about Tony Blair, Tony Blair relies on my staff for him and then the project development. And, we're, and so far, we've been basically trying to tread water because you've got this terrible conundrum that until you have security, the Israelis are not going to allow movement. And if you don't have movement, you're going to have a devil of a time getting any sort of development. But one of the things that Rob and I were talking about was uh, a mortgage fund that OPIC is interested in developing in the cooperation with IFC. And just think about the effect of this. Um, you know, you're, 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 you're giving people a longer term view of the society. They're, they're investing in something. That's their, and in the case of the Palestinian territories, people in this room may not think about it, but they're worried about their land. They're worried who's going to be owning their land. And this gives them a sense of ownership uh, of, of the land. Um, it also uh, creates construction jobs. It also helps create that as a financial market. So there's things that, you know, if if we if we can create the conditions to try to create some economic development and hope in the Middle East, I think this is a very important part. Again, more broadly, it's not only a question of the Palestinian territories. Going back to the question on gender, you know, you look at some of the major oil producing countries. You know, they may only represent about 10% of the public, but they also have a challenge of creating jobs. They've got a real youth bulge in these countries. And they've got to create jobs and opportunity, and they've got to figure out how to integrate women effectively in that workforce. So this is an area where we may be able to share experience and knowledge. And in the case of some of the Arab countries in the Gulf, they're paying us out of fees for some of this knowledge. But the last point I wanted to connect with this is this area of post-conflict and fragile states because this is one of the other strategic themes that, that I've tried to focus on. And it's interesting. The field of development 10 years ago would have basically treated the Cote d'Ivoire, the Hades, the Liberias, the Afghanistans as just sort of big development cases. And I think what people have learned is they need special uh, sort of attention and design. Um, and in part, you have countries in different situations, ones that are declining, ones that have just come out of conflict, ones that have been out of it for a while. Um, and just to give you a little example of what makes a difference is that you might think in a country uh, like Liberia that the first thing you need to do is get a lot of resources there quickly. Well, if you don't build the basic institutional governance structures, we're back to that issue, it's like pouring m money on sand. And in fact, you may create a worse result because all of a sudden you have an asset in a fragile situation that people might start to fight over. 
So you need to create some basic capacity before you put the money in. But on the other hand, as an international system, we're too little and too late in putting resources into those issues. So um, these are problems that are of unique nature. What we do and what we do in development will make a big difference in terms of uh, you know, whether the world is a place that breeds trouble or creates opportunity. And on that note? Do be kind enough to join me in a hand of thanks and appreciation to Judy and Bob.